the most important question is not the capability of the church facility, but how the church sees itself. In other words, I was asked to speak about how can building effectiveness enhance ministry, especially for megachurches. And the first thing I want to observe is you have megachurches in absolutely terrible facilities. Well, let's, let's take the word megachurch off. Let's just say churches. You've got churches with incredibly effective ministry with terrible facilities. You have churches with knock-dead facilities that are dead. So while the two can help each other, they don't, there's no guarantee. And if we had the tag team up from earlier this morning, they would probably, you got it, good. Uh, they would. <laughs> They would uh, probably have some statistics from their research. But, uh, you know, Saddleback moved 79 times from its, I'm going to, let's see, can I get a, no, I can't. All right, I'll just lean. Saddleback moved 79 times between, oh, I know what I can do. I can enlarge my screen. No, there we go. Take one. Oh, thanks. And I enlarged the screen anyway. I know of no causal connection between building design and ministry effectiveness. Lots of churches have highly effective ministry with no building, and intentionally so. Saddleback Church moved 79 times between its 1980 founding and its worship center in 1996. New Hope, Hawaii, Wayne Cordero, at 11,000 attendants, has just now bought its first facility for worship. They have volunteers that get up at 3 in the morning and go to Farragut High School and set the place up. And they built a wonderful relationship with the community in the, in the process. They, each year they're like, man, this carpet stinks. Well, why don't we offer to buy it for the church as our thank you? And they built goodwill and the, the, the school loves them and uh, all kinds of, of advantages. Redeemer Presbyterian, New York City. Tim Keller at 5,000 still rents three different locations. Watermark Community Church with 2,000 attendants intends to stay in a local school. So you've got, you've got churches with no facilities that have, have thrived. You've got, on the other hand, churches with knock dead facilities that used to be great, but now they're a noose around their neck. I went to a church just outside of uh, Maryland and uh, it had been a wonderful church, and the, the pastor died, and the successor pastor, which turned out to be his, his wife, just didn't have the, the, the same anointing, you could say. And then they brought in one of their sons, and, and he wasn't uh, a match to his dad. And, and so here were like, the Sunday I went, like 200 people in this thing that seated uh, thousands. And it was, it was so discouraging, whereas it didn't, it didn't need to be. And I'm, you think about mortgage payments and all these things. Or, regrettably, hardly a month goes by without some moral failure. And, and I guess the one most in the news, so I'm not gossiping, uh, or Earl Park, Atlanta. You know, for many, many years, this was a thriving uh, cathedral. And, and now here's the 7,000-seat facility that, with like 500 people on a weekend, and, and think of all the implications of tails wagging dogs. So just as money follows vision, so does effective facilities follows effective ministries. Just as abundant money doesn't guarantee vision, nor will great facilities guarantee effective ministry. So this is probably not news to you, but I just want to say the obvious because it's so, you know, when people get excited about building a new building and, and, and everything, they think that this new building is, is going to do all thing, kinds of things for Christ. And, and it does and it doesn't. You know, so often after you move into a building program, everybody goes, ah, and, and they quit and they back off and, and there are negative things. Now, there can also be very intentional attendance verses and reach, reaching of people, but, but good buildings are no guarantees of effective ministry. 